Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone that's here, and there's going to be more in on their way, there always is, and there's people watching online, just a reminder to invite people to watch either Facebook live streaming, YouTube, and afterwards you can actually text them links to the messages, and we're in Jeremiah chapter 2, and um, we live in a culture where people pursue ease and comfort above anything else, and um Sadly, that culture has come into the church. And there are parts of the Bible that comfort us. There's parts of the Bible that encourage us. Then there's parts of the Bible that convict us and even, let's just say, purify us. And Jeremiah is a blast furnace. And it is not easy to read. It's probably some of the most convicting verses in the entire Bible. And If you just want ease and comfort and to feel good, then you probably don't want to read it. But hopefully, we want truth more than ease and comfort. And I don't know about you guys, I want to be in God's will. I want to be right in His sight. And sometimes we have to step into the blast furnace. And it's a purifying furnace. And God will use it to burn away things that might get between us and him. How many of you want, if there's something between you and the Lord, you want God to remove it from your heart? And this, let me tell you, again, growing up, Jeremiah was just a flamethrower. It was so hard to read, but so good to read. And um, and so, thankfully, God's given us his truth. We're not going to compromise and, you know, just share the things that are comforting. We're going to share the parts that are convicting. And, um, and that's, if we continue doing that, God's going to honor that. He's going to honor his word. And um, worship is a time just to thank God for his goodness, thank him for his truth, and, um, and it prepares our hearts for his word. So, Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Anoint Christian as he plays and sings. And, Lord, prepare our hearts to hear from you. I know this is a soul-searching heart of your word. And, Lord, open our eyes to what you see. And just like David had prayed, Lord, search us, try us. If there's anything in us that's not right in your sight, show us, Lord, and free us from it. And um, just bless this time. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. the praises of his people. down from the lofty mountain 
mountain's grandeur and hear the brook and I feel that gentle breeze then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God, your son not sparing, sent him to die. Lord, I scarce can take it in. That on that cross, all my burdens gladly bearing, Jesus bled and died take away all my sin then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul How great thou art, how great thou art. Any day now, Jesus will come back. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How Thou art, how great Thou art. Lord, you are so great beyond our comprehension. Maker of heaven and earth, just spoke, and now it all is here, existing under your control. And Lord, we, the redeemed, Sing, when I think that God, his son not sparing, Lord, you sent him to die. We scarcely can take it in, Lord, but we are so thankful tonight that Jesus was sent by the Father, willingly came to rescue us, to die for us, all because of your love for us. We worship you. We praise you. Truly, truly, how great is our God. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, and all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, darkness tries to hide. 
hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God Age to age he comes And time is in his hands Beginning at the end Beginning at the end The God at three in one Father, Spirit, Son Is the Lion and the Lamb Lion and the Lamb, how great are you, God? Sing with me, how great are you, God? All will see how great, how great are you, God? You're the name above all. God so loved this world You gave your only son He was nailed to that tree And he died for you and me Jesus died for all our sin And then he rose again He's the Holy Son of God He's the Savior of the world. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. How great are you, God? Sing with me. How great are you, God? All will see how great, how great are you, God? How great are you? How great are you, God? Sing with me. How great are you, God? All will see how great, how great are you, God? For God so loved this world, you gave your only son He was nailed to that tree And he died just for me Jesus died for all my sin and Then he rose again He's the Holy Son of God He's the Savior of the world he is Jesus Christ, our Lord. How great are you, God? Sing with me. How great are you, God? All will see how great, how great are you, God? Sing to Jesus and how God, sing with me, how great are you, God, all will see how great, how great are you, God.
but God demonstrates his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ, his only son, died for us. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That he should give his only son. To make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss As the Father turns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to Behold the man upon that cross All my sins upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held you there Until it was accomplished Your dying breath has brought me life I know that it is A 
Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that God has done everything that he has done because of who he is. And speaking of our salvation, adopted as his children, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, sealed with his Holy Spirit, all for the praise of the glory of his grace. I love listening to the birds in the morning singing to the Lord. They're singing to the Lord, thanking him for all the food and provision. They're just rejoicing in God, their creator. But us, we rejoice in God, our creator, and and our Savior. His amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. I was blind, but now I see. Twas grace, twas grace that taught my heart. To fear and your grace, my fears really. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed, and my chains are gone. I've been set free And my God, my Savior You ransom me And like a flood Your mercy reigns On promise good to me his word my hope it secures he will my shield and my portion be as long as life endures cause my my chains are gone, and I've been set free, and my God, my soon dissolve like snow and that sun forbear to shine oh but God who called me below will be I'll be forever thine. Amen. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone perish. Pluck them out of my hand, because my Father who gave them to me is greater than all. No one can pluck them out of my Father's hand. I 
tonight. Father, I won. Lord, we're thankful that you're right in our midst. We're singing these songs to you, Lord. You're worthy of it all. You are Jesus, our great Messiah. We sing this to you in worship and adoration, Lord. Be glorified, be lifted up. You became sin, who knew no sin. We might become your righteousness. And you humbled yourself. And you carry the cross, your love so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah, you're the name above all names, you're our blessed Redeemer. Lord Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners and the ransom from heaven. You are Jesus Messiah, the Lord of body the bread your blood the wine was broken and poured out all for love and the whole earth trembled as that veil was torn your love so amazing your love so amazing Jesus Messiah, you're the name above all names, you're our blessed Redeemer, Lord Emmanuel, your only rescue for sinners, you're the ransom from heaven you are Jesus Messiah the Lord of all all our hope is in you all our hope is in you and all our Glory to you, God, the light of the world. Jesus Messiah, you're the name above all names. You're our blessed Redeemer. Lord Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, you're the ransom from heaven, you are Jesus Messiah, the Lord of all. All our hope is in you, our only hope is in you, and all the glory to you, God, the light of the world, Jesus Messiah.
You're our blessed Redeemer, Lord Emmanuel. You're the rescue for sinners and a ransom from hell. You are Jesus, Messiah, the Lord of all. Jesus, Messiah, the Lord of all. Jesus, you are Lord of all. Help us to let you be Lord of completely all of us. Thank you for the power, eternal power of your word. It's living, powerful. Lord, speak to our hearts. We need to be cleansed. Show us our sins tonight, Lord. And show us Jesus as we run to that cross. And bring a great revival among your people, Lord, even tonight through the preaching of your word and our response to humble ourselves. Seek your face, turn from our wicked ways. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. (laughs) About what? Oh, yep, it's on there. I got, I got it on there. Yep. Well, that was awesome worship time. Um, so, a reminder, um, some announcements. There is um, the men's study is this Saturday coming up. Um, and that's at, um, what time does that start, Great. Nine for breakfast for the study upstairs. Um, also, there is somebody... Um, I was contacted, a lady who's got some health problems and um, in kind of in a desperate situation but needs help moving tomorrow. And so right now, myself and three of my boys, maybe four of my boys, are the labor force. And um, it's not huge. It's just basically one refrigerator, stove, washer and dryer, a couple, of, you know, a bed. There's not a lot of stuff. But um, moving... Oh, I hate it. That's why I offer to help people because I'd want someone to help me. So the more people that's, you know, I know it's short notice, but if you're able to, I'm going to basically use my trailer. I get back here, meet here at 11, probably done by two. It's not going to take super long. It's not far away. So if anyone's able to help with that, that'd be tremendous. Um, a reminder, worship and prayer, seven o'clock Thursday and a um, huge blessing. Just a time to wait on the Lord and hear his voice and it's really a time for God. You know, we some, a lot of times we come to meet and it's for us. That's for him. It's his will being done. We want to pray for um, this Sunday. After, we, have, we have the Sunday service. And I should have stressed this because people ask. We have the normal Sunday service. And then we have the baptism picnic at Wallace Lake from 2 to 7. Baptism will probably be around 3. And um, there's a, information out in the lobby. Um, the church is going to provide... You know, hamburgers, hot dogs, and it gives all the information there. But um, there is a green and white pavilion, like a tent-like thing that we're that someone donated for us to use. And so, you know, there's there's volleyball. You know, people can bring like bocce ball and do different things. But um, so just if you're able to come, that's on Sunday, and it is a it's it's really neat because that's when both services people can come, and um, and there's just something about that a public testimony, baptism, you're identifying with the Lord. And um, I don't know if there's anything we do where I sense God's presence more, you know, in that. And it's just a public testimony. Um, let's see here. Next pastor's class, September 10th. It normally would be the first Saturday because of Labor Day weekend we're moving it. And just a reminder again, we have the, for children's safety, once service starts, the doors, the children's ministry, you have to be buzzed in and out um, in case of emergency. There is a way to get through right there. We just want to keep the wrong people out because we're living in a nutty world. So basically, that's why that's there. Homeless ministries have an 
a meeting this Sunday, September 4th, after the second service, to discuss the next outreach. And um, let's see, and again, if you're able to help with this move, it'll be two or three hours. Um, talk to me afterwards, text me, let me know. And so with that, we're going to start. So you can open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 2. And um, there's some parts of the Bible that are comforting and encouraging. Some parts are convicting. Jeremiah is a spiritual blast furnace. And um, you know, we're living in a culture that loves comfort and ease. And, um, but you know, we, we need to love truth even more. And I've read Jeremiah probably 15 times in my life. And um, it is one convicting book. And the thing is, it's hard to read, but it's good to read if you love truth. How many of you, if there are things in your life that weren't right, you don't want God to show you? And see, the danger is self-deception. But anyway, the thing is, every one of us are a soul that lives in a body. This body allows you to interact with the, the rest of the world. Inside of our soul, there is an empty place that only God can fill. And, um, and actually, this is the only source of peace, joy, and love. You know, the five senses can give you pleasure but it'll never give you a peace, it'll never give you joy, never, you never experience love, that comes from God. And until God fills that place, we have this longing, this thirst, it's for God. The problem is people try to fill it with other things, pleasures of this life, you know, alcohol, like sex, drugs, um, money, possessions, fame. Um, and the thing is, no matter what you try of those things to fill it, it leaves you not just empty, I think it leaves you even more empty. And um, thing is, we can also try to fill it with religion. There are many false religions out there, and they focus on outward ceremony and rituals, also a code of conduct. And um, you can go through the motions of serving and knowing God, but, but that can also leave you empty. Um, it's only through Jesus and his cross that God will, will then fill us with his spirit and satisfy that longing. Jesus said, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What he's saying is, worship of God starts on the inside. You could be going through the motions outwardly and be completely detached from God on the inside. In this chapter, God's going to point out how his people, they were following him through outward religion, but they were not following him from the heart or in secret. You know, they had, in a sense, a double lives. And um, this chapter <laughs> is a powerful wake-up call to examine our own hearts. There are times we need God to shine the light and, um, and show us what he sees, places that we might be blind to, where we could be drifting. I mean, how many of you would agree, if you're starting to drift, you want God to get your attention? Do you want that? You know, I, I want him to. I don't want to drift far away. And so... And this is one of those things just to pray that, you know, it's not for someone else to hear. It's like, Lord, help me to see. Help me to get what you're saying. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word. Um, it's very convicting, very hard to read some of this. And, Lord, um, help us to hear what applies to us. Help us to be open. And, um, and Lord, change us. We want to be like you. We want to be close to you. And, Lord, we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. The nation of Israel had been divided. They had civil war. Idolatry was the issue, false religion. Um, God pointed this out through Isaiah. And there was the division was Israel, 10 northern tribes. They were conquered by Assyria. And um, they didn't listen to God, and, 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 and the destruction came. God also warned what was left, the two southern tribes, which is Judah, that um, the same was going to happen to them by Babylon. You know, and that was told 100 years before with Isaiah. Well, Jeremiah is at the point where it's going to happen. And, um, and they're not listening. They're not learning. What's interesting is Josiah began to reign when Jeremiah started. And there was actually an outward reformation. Josiah was the right kind of leader. He really was right with God. The problem was the people went through the motions outwardly, but there was no change in the heart. And that's the danger of... So often we think, oh, if we get a president or a political leader that's godly, that that's the answer. You can get a godly leader and the nation still be in rebellion. And Josiah was a godly leader. 
he did everything right, but but God's going to he's going to you know the nation still was not turning to God from the heart. Jeremiah was young; he was under twenty years old when he was called. But the problem is, the reality is, God was telling him to speak, and no one was going to listen. Here's the thing: I think God's calling us today to speak truth and love, no matter what the age. I think He's specifically calling out young people, and young is a relative term, but at whatever age, to basically, you know, give your. The younger you are, the more of life you have to give them. As you get older, there's less of your life to give to them, and. And um, how many believe a young person in their teens should give the rest of their life to God? You know, so often I meet people who came to the Lord at a later age and they wish they had done it sooner. You know, I did at age 16. As soon as I heard the gospel clearly, it was like I was saved. And um, I want to go back to chapter 1 just to highlight a couple of verses of Jeremiah's call. So chapter 1, verse 5 um, God says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. So by the way, life begins before conception. Interesting thought. And he said, before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet of the nation. So before someone's even conceived, God has a plan for them. Then said I, oh Lord, I can't speak. I'm a child. But the Lord said to me, see, not I'm a child, for you'll go to all that I send thee, and whoever I command thee, you'll speak, hey, you're going to do what I say, because I'm going to be with you. Be not afraid of their faces. Don't look at their reactions, and that's important if you're serving God. It doesn't matter how people react. For I am with thee to deliver thee, says the Lord. Um, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over nations and over kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. Meaning truth was going to tear down the lies and the evil, which that happens, and not everybody likes that. And that sets the stage for God to rebuild, whether it's a nation or a life. And then jump over to verse 17. He said, you therefore gird up your loins. It means get ready to run, get ready to work. Arise and speak to them that I command thee, be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. Meaning, don't base your obeying speaking by how people react. That means there are times God's going to tell you to tell people things. They're not going to want to hear it. They're not going to like it. We still got to obey. We still got to speak the truth. And that's the problem with the secret sensitive movement. It was all about not offending people. Let me tell you something. <laughs> you know, I'm not worried about offending you. I don't want to offend God. And God says we're to speak his whole truth, and some of it does offend. And he goes, For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city, an iron pillar, a brazen wall against the whole land, and against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, and against the priests thereof, and against the people thereof of the land. Meaning, you're going to stand up and speak, and he's saying, I'm going to protect you, because you're going to say things you're not going to like. And they'll fight against you, but they will not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, says the Lord, to deliver thee. You know, if you stand up for the Lord and speak his truth, He's going to defend you. You know, fight God's battles, and then he'll take care of you. And so there's the context. And so, um, you know, he's, and he's going to give a message to the nation. And so we need to hear the message and make sure, you know, you see what applies to us personally. But also there's a lesson here in being a Jeremiah. Imagine God telling you to speak to people some of these words, and sometimes we have to do that because, again, the New Testament has parts that are very convicting. So verse 1, chapter 2, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, and again, how does the word of the Lord come to us? What's well, a still small voice? And um, how do you recognize God's word when he speaks to you? Well, when you read the Bible, you get to know him, and that gives you discernment to know when God's telling you things. But verse 2, he says, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of the youth, the love of thy espousals when you went after me in the wilderness and the land that was not sown. Israel was holiness to the Lord and the first fruits of his increase and all that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, says the Lord. So God's remembering at the beginning. And I think, you know, when you look at, you know, when God called him with Moses, obviously there was a rebellious group that died in the wilderness. But the group that Joshua led into the promised land was devoted to the Lord. And also, um, when David was reigning, and they're, and they're, you know, at the beginning, and, he, and he's, what he's doing is he's using the idea of the first love. Think about people 
who are married before they're married. The dating, the courting, the engagement, you know, marriage, the honeymoon. There's an excitement there. There's a love there. They like being together. And he's using that picture to say how Israel at one time liked being with God. They wanted to please God. And um and it's um it's interesting that the problem comes in marriage is we lose that first love. We lose that excitement. And um you know what is the first love? I think you're you're seeking to win them and you're always trying to please them. And um and I and, and there's a personal analogy I can share and this is a good lesson in marriage, but I'm going to apply it to the Lord. You know, the first 20 years of our marriage, you know, I was focused on work and ultimately it was the church. And, um, and Sheila had her hands full with 14 children, raising and homeschooling. And it's easy to grow distant from each other. Well, some of my older ones, you know, Matthew, when he was seeking to win the heart of Nikki, who he married and they have five kids. Tim, who... Um, I don't know if he's back there doing the sound, but oh, there he is, back there, winning Elizabeth, and then Caleb with Lauren. And it was interesting how I watched these couples, how excited they were to be with each other. They were always happy. They were always smiling. There was this joy, this first love excitement. And I kind of remember going, you know, with, with Sheila, it's like, we don't have that anymore. And it caused me to analyze it, to really think about it. Like, why is that? And um, what it is, the first love, at the beginning, you're trying to win the person, okay? And you only want them to see the good side of you. You don't want them to see the faults. And kind of a running joke, and Lizzie's a wonderful daughter, and, um, and, and Tim, I think, is quite happy with her. But we kind of had a running joke, you know, Tim only saw the best parts of Lizzie. And um, but there was parts that we knew he never see it, he never saw. <laughs> she could be a feisty one. And we joked and said, there's a no return policy. And um, but but the issue was, and to think about it, in a way, the dating courting phase, you're actually willfully deceiving the other person, meaning you only want them to see the good parts. There's things you would never do until you're married. And then something changes and you, you, you stop trying to please them. You let them see maybe a bad attitude. You say things you wouldn't have said at the beginning because you're afraid they're gonna run away. And the thing is, you're trying to be everything you can be that they would want to please them and you're concerned about that person. And after marriage, it just stops. We stop doing those things. And um, so I decided personally that I want to renew that. I want to have the first love with Sheila. I want to, I want to, I want to renew that. And I still remember the first time I wanted to do something for her, and I, 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 I filled the bathtub with bubble bath, and I put candles, and I had little nice little snacks, and it was real nice. And it was funny. She thought I was doing it for me. And I said, honey... This is for you. And, and so I did that. It was about 10 years ago. And um, little things like flowers. You know, whenever I go shopping on Thursdays, get her flowers. Did that for, done that for a good 10 years, almost without exception. Once a week, a date night. Once a year to get away. Because you know what? Here's the thing, guys. You have to invest time with each other. Okay, it's easy when you have kids and work to stop having just time. I mean, Sheila and I just last week, I have a friend that one of my sponsors, um, great guy, Dave Nelson, he has a camper and a pontoon boat on this lake. And in the last three years, he's let Sheila and I go. We only got to go three or four days this time. You know, it seemed kind of short, but we need time with just us. And it's funny, even when we're up there, you know what we kept thinking? We want to invite the kids and the grandkids up. But we got to resist that because we need time together. We have to go and get away. You have to purpose to invest time in a relationship or you grow apart. And um, little things like, you know, when it's time for bed, she goes in the bathroom, I turn the bed down, make it ready. In the morning, I get up, make her coffee, I make the bed. She hasn't had to make the bed in probably 10 years. Um, house repairs, doing the wash, you know, doing things that I know, like if I was trying to win her. Okay. Now, what's interesting is for a couple years there, I did that. And I, I would say I didn't really see much of a response. 
not that I'm doing that, but you know. And I'm like, honey, um, do you notice anything different? And she goes, she goes, yeah. And I go, well, she says, I'm trying to get used to the new mic, okay? Because we got so used to just doing our own thing. And again, you pretty much ignore the other person. And I've still tried to continue doing that. And, um, but see, that whole picture I just gave you, let's apply it to the Lord. Go to Revelation 2. Because this is exactly what God is doing. Is he's, he's applying this issue of a young couple in marriage to our relationship with him. And Jesus brings this up to a church in the book of Revelation, the church of Ephesus, Revelation 2.1. He said, under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he that holds the seven stars um, in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and I cannot bear them which are evil. And you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and found them liars. And you have borne, you have patience for my name's sake, have labored and not fainted. And you know what? Sheila and I were faithful to each other. We did the things we're supposed to do. She took care of the house I work. We did all that stuff. But, but something, we were drifting because we, were, we weren't focusing on the relationship with each other and trying to win each other in that love. And that can happen with God. You can go through the motions. You can still walk with the Lord, serve the Lord. Notice he says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. And there's a good list of things they did that were favorable. But he said, but you know what? But there's something more important, and this has to be addressed. And he said, because you've left your first love. You've lost that excitement and the priority of your relationship with the Lord. You know, and so to win it back with Sheila, I had to spend time with her. I had to start doing things that I did at the beginning. And that's exactly what Jesus says. He says, remember, therefore, from when you were fallen. And so re remember when you were first saved. I don't know about you guys, but I love reading my Bible. I love being at church. Whenever the church doors were open, I, w I was there, excited for God, wanting to please him. You know, again, the danger is it can become rituals where you go through the motions. And long before you backslide into sin, you start backsliding in the heart where you're just not excited about the Lord. And I don't know about you guys, over my Christian life, I've been a Christian, gosh, 40-something years, um, there's been those times where all of a sudden I catch myself. I'm not, it's not willful sin. I'm not out in rebellion, but I'm just losing the excitement for the Lord. And the thing is, and I'm usually getting too busy, and I'm not spending time with them. That's usually the key. And, so, and there's the cure. Remember when you're first saved. Put yourself back in that place. The joy of being forgiven. The beauty of the hope. The reality of God's goodness. You're never alone. And again, this is, and this is true in marriage. I think you need to remember what it was like when you first met. I think it rekindles those thoughts. As a matter of fact, I'm, I actually found a box of letters that Sheila wrote to me. We, we, got, we got married, and three months later, I went to basic training for six weeks. And she wrote me letters. Man, they were some steamy letters. I'm like, honey, do you read this? Do you remember? <laughs> she said, I don't want to read that stuff. Anyway, what's funny, I remember her saying once, we were married about two years, and she's like, honey, my problem is I like you too much. I'm like, I don't see a problem with that. And um, I'm like, can you like try to remember those thoughts? <laughs> try to rekindle those? But, um, but I, I do believe, guys, that I can remember those first couple of years. And I can remember how, we saw, how I saw her. And you know what it does? It revives those thoughts. Well, you know what? Do this with God. Remember what it was like when you knew your sins were forgiven, when the word was so exciting. And, um, and again, we, you, know, you wanted to please that other person. Listen, you wanted to please God. You wanted to be in his will. And, um, and that's what he says, remember. Or from where you are, repent and do the first works over. Start reading your Bible again. You know, you know, the things you did to seek him and learn of him, renew that again. And again, and it's something he says to do. Do these things again. You know, um, do the first works. And, you know, read, pray, serve God. And when the church is open, be here. You know, look for, just make him everything again. Share your faith thing is, just as you must invest time with a person or you drift, you've got to invest time with God. Listen, as I am preparing this Bible study, I'm like, Lord, I need to apply this. 
Like it's kind of made me renew. Like I need to, I need to, not just, I mean, you can sit and read the Bible where you just kind of go through the motion and then you can sit where you're really sitting with the Lord. Does everybody know the difference? And I can, the danger of a pastor is I can study just for what I'm teaching, but not just to spend time with the Lord. And it's, it's amazing too when you start doing that, how the devil won't like it. You know, I, I was trying to today, and it was just amazing, the distractions. And I realized the devil would rather you serve God than have a relationship with God. You know, it starts with him. That's where he said, Martha, you're troubled many things, one thing is needful. And there's nothing wrong with serving God. It isn't like I'm going to stop serving him. I didn't go, okay, I'm going to stop serving him. I'm going to keep serving him, but I'm going to make sure that I get that time with him. That's huge. And so go back now, Jeremiah 2, verse 4. He says, Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. He became vain. So what they're saying is, what was, is God at fault? If somebody drifts, if somebody starts going away and getting caught up in the world, did God somehow fail? Did he do something wrong? God is good. God is love. God is faithful. God's plans are best. Why would you leave? And, and that is a good question to answer. I think people leave because evil is attractive. Evil, evil is seductive, and evil lies. You know, you could be walking with the Lord and be tempted with pornography or going to a party where there's alcohol or drugs or whatever, and it lies to you. Oh, that you'll be satisfied. That looks like fun. But it's, it, what does it say, sense pleasurable for what? For a season, short time, but it, but it lies to you. And sometimes people give in to the lie, and they follow that temptation. And notice he says, walking after vanity. Vanity means emptiness. So anything other than God that you seek satisfaction in will leave you empty. And notice it says, became vain, meaning you became empty. If I turn to sex outside of marriage or pornography or drugs or alcohol, the party scene, whatever the world's offering, if I turn to that, I will become empty. It will not satisfy. That is the lie. And, um, and you become like what you follow. And if you follow emptiness, you will become empty. And, um, and so many people do. And, um, and, and it, neither said they, where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed and where no man dwelt, meaning God brought us through impossible things. God's been good. He's been faithful. But they, but they didn't get to a place where they're like, hey, where's the Lord? Meaning they weren't seeking God. Guys, there has to be something in us that says, God, I want you. I want to know you. I want to seek you. How do you do that? You get alone with him. You open your Bible. This book is where you seek him. It's, you know, if you want to spend t get closer to your spouse, you spend time with them. You talk to them. You listen to them. I mean, that Sheila and I, when we were you know, away um, for a couple of days. We just had time to talk, to listen to each other. If you don't get those times, you get distant. Well, sometimes you just need to get alone and say, Lord, here's what's going on. Just talk to him. He's there. He hears you. Pour out your heart. Read the word. He'll speak to you. It's amazing. I was reading Psalm 118 today. So rich about just God being there. He's, you know, he heard when I cried. He delivered me out of my distress. He's it's all about God's good. He's faithful. And I love it when you read the, you ever read the Bible and it's like God's right in the room talking to you? How many of you read the Bible like that? And that's how it is. That's how it's supposed to be. This book is alive. It'll change you forever. That's how you seek him. But they, they weren't going, well, let's seek the Lord, the one who did all this for us. And um, it was in light of all that God did for them. And we need to remember what he's done for us. The cross, our sins are forgiven. He's given us eternal hope. And we need to have that sense of gratitude. And again, and I've heard someone say, seek God's face, not just his hand. It's okay to ask for God's help, but how about just, God, I just want you. You know, you're enough. How many would say the Lord's enough? And we, but we can forget that. Um, verse 7, and I brought you into a plenteous country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered it, you defiled my land, made my heritage an abomination. Meaning God gave us forgiveness. He gave us a spirit. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, and peace. But instead of thankfulness, they turn to the world. And, um, you know, 1 John 2, 15 to 17, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And all that's in the world, unless the eyes, unless the flesh, part of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he does the will of God abides forever. It's like, 
the, the pagans, all this stuff, how is the world living? They're living for money. They're living for pleasure. They're living, all these th things the world's caught up in, don't let your love, your affection go towards those things or the stuff that's in it. Yes, God gives us good things to enjoy, but our heart's not to be on those things. How many would say God is good? Does he give us good gifts? Hey, how many of you like food? He gives us good food, right? Relationships, friends, he, he can give us things, needs for our life. But my heart's not to be set on those things. My heart's to be set on him, and I'm not to pursue those things. Psst, and he'll take care of that other stuff. And um, what's interesting, he says that, that the heritage became an abomination. Abomination is something disgusting, meaning they started following the pagan practices of the world around them and the idols around them. And the thing is, guys, the idols all represented things. They represented money. They represented pleasure. They represented sex. They represented alcohol. And we don't have to have the little statues to be following those things. And in verse 8, it says, The priest said not, and this is so sad when the leaders are not seeking the Lord. The priest didn't say, where is the Lord? Hey, they should be saying that. The leaders should be saying, hey, guys, are you seeking the Lord? Where is he? Are you, are you looking to hear his voice? And they that handle the law knew me not. Wow, they didn't even know God. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked into the things that do not profit. They were false teachers with a false doctrine. They were pointing people to things that do not profit. Um, go to Second Peter 2. and There's a kind of a parallel to this, a warning for the New Testament church. And... Um, 2 Peter 2, verse 1. And this, I believe, is addressing very specifically the prosperity doctrine and also the, the basically positive confession doctrine. Let me tell you something, guys. The prosperity doctrine is a lie. It basically says if you're right with God, you'll be healthy and wealthy. And there are teachers, and, and probably the most prominent one is Joel Osteen. Let me tell you something, guys. He is a false teacher with a false gospel, and he is teaching lies straight from Satan. He's not a messenger of God. He is a messenger from the devil, period. He never mentions repentance from sin, you know, anything about the Lord or holiness. It's all about health and wealth and things that the devil will use to attract us. He's using the exact things of the world, and it is lies. And you know what? The church is packed. Why? Because it's what people want to hear. And if you look here, chapter 1, or chapter 2, verse 1, um, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who privately will bring in damnable heresies. And that's one of them. Let me tell you something, guys. To be more godly does not mean you're going to be wealthy. Okay, get used to that fact. And wealth isn't the goal. You know, the goal of life is not to be wealthy, the, the goal of life is to be godly. We're not to pursue money and material things, and it is such a lie. And um, but that's what they're putting in front of people. And the thing is, in the positive confession is tied to it. And I, you know, I don't usually name people, but I feel like there's so many people caught up with this guy who's a fake. He's a complete fake. You know, he will speak. You, know, you might be lonely, and friends are coming to you. You might be in debt, and wealth is coming to you. You might be sick, and health is coming to you. He actually believes. As he's saying those words, he's creating that in the person's life. Okay, positive confession means you can create with your words. <laughs> that is such a lie. They say, oh, there's power in words. See, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. So God said, there's power in words. Wrong emphasis. God said. How many believe there's power in God's word? Thank God there's not power in our words. You're accountable for your words. But it doesn't mean you create with your words. And that's where the damnable heresy, denying the Lord that bought them, you know, bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. So the crowds are going to follow the lies. And look at this, by reason of whom the way of truth is evil spoken of. And it says, meaning people are going to look at them and go, Christianity's a sham. It's all about getting money. Because they always tell you to give to them. They're the ones that's wealthy. And through covetousness, meaning they're going to use your greed Shall they with feigned fake words make merchandise of you? Meaning they don't care about you. They want your money. And they tell you that if you give to them, you're going to get wealthy. So they're appealing to your, listen guys, my giving to God is never so that I can get wealthy. I'm giving to God out of thanks for what he already gave me. How many of you are thankful for what God's given you? 
How many believe everything you've been given is from God? So you give to him out of thanks. It's never to get. It's totally the wrong motive. Everything about this. And he says, whose judgment now of a long time lingers not, and their damnation slumbers not. What's interesting is go to 2 Corinthians 11. And the thing is, guys, the, you know, the, the whole positive confession doctrine, when you go, go into it in detail, what they teach is faith is a force that God used to create the world. And you control this force with your words. And if you can use words like God did to you move this force called faith, you can be what? God. And they've, and, they, and they've said those exact words. Let me tell you something. Faith, it's, and they use the verse in Hebrews, through faith we know God created the heavens and the earth. They say, look, see, God used faith to create the world. No, no, no. Wrong definition of faith. What it's saying is, I wasn't there. God tells me that he created the world. And so it's through faith we know God created. How many of you believe God created the world? You weren't there. You accept that by faith. It's not saying faith is a force that God used. Completely false doctrine. And I'm, I'm St. Corinthians 11, verse 2. Paul says, um, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. You know, guys, it's all simple. And he says, but if he that comes preaches another Jesus whom you've not received or another spirit whom you've not received or another gospel. So there is another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. You might bear well with it. What he's saying is you might be putting up with this. You shouldn't. The idea here is there is another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. And we need to be on guard. And look at verse 13. Um, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end should be according to their works. You know, it isn't that the devil is trying to um, stop the church. What he's trying to do is infiltrate it. And he's trying to bring in false teaching to infect the church. And again, I like where Paul said the simplicity that's in Christ. It's real simple. You believe and receive Jesus, you get to know him through his word and prayer, and you live what he says. It's so simple. But anyway, go back to um, Jeremiah. And um, the problem is, guys, people don't want the truth. And 2 Timothy 4 says that, um, you know, we're to preach the word. He said, the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but even themselves teachers having itching ears, and they'll turn away the ears from the truth and be turned to fables. What that's saying is there's going to come a time where people won't want the Bible, the only reason false teachers exist is people want to hear lies. They don't want to hear the truth. And that's why guys at the need, I need the purifying effect of his word. You know, and even if it makes me uncomfortable. And we go back to Jeremiah 2, verse 9. And he says, Wherefore I will yet plead with you, says the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. Meaning God's trying to get their attention. And if they won't listen, he's going to the kids and the grandkids. You know what's interesting? Is I've seen adults who rebelled against God, and I've seen God get the heart of their kids. And, um, and, and, he, and he'll, he'll reach them and, and use them to deal with the parents. Verse 10, For pass over the isles of, of Chittim and see and send unto Kedar, consider diligent. What it is, one was far east, the other west. What he's saying is look from the east and the west and see if there be such a thing. And what is it? Has a nation changed their gods that are no gods? My people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Meaning, look at the Buddhists and the Hindus and Muslims. You know, they're following false religions. And do they adhere to them? And, and are they loyal to them? They're very loyal to them. They hold on to them and they're following a lie. Why would someone following the true God turn away? And yet it happens. And, um, and again, why is this the case? I think there's spiritual warfare. Listen, guys, demons are going to make people who believe a lie comfortable in their lie. And he's going to put pressure on those who are following the truth. So there is a spiritual warfare, and that's why this goes on. Verse 12, he says, Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. Meaning, it's like this is a shocking thing. Israel had the true God. All these other nations followed Ashtoreth and Baal and Molech. They were idols. They were nothing. And, um, and Israel went away. It was shocking. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed out cisterns, broken cisterns, that cisterns that can hold no water. So imagine 
a fountain of living water bubbling up fresh, clean. If you're thirsty on a hot day and you find this bubbling up fresh water, man, you know, you take a drink, oh, this is so good. Compare that to a cistern where the rain comes in and it holds it, but see, that would have bugs in it because it's not, it's not bubbling up. It would get stale. If it had a crack, it'd have dirt coming up. And sometimes it wouldn't even hold water. And so what he's saying is, the, are your relationship with Jesus, where you open the Bible, you spend time with him, it goes beyond the five senses. There's something in your soul, the spirit. You know, it says, what does it say? Those who wait in the Lord will mount up with wings as eagles. Something inside gets lifted up. There's a joy, there's a peace. How many of you have just been down and discouraged and you sat, you got alone, you open your Bible, you know, you turn on worship music, you prayed, you read, and by the time you were done, you just felt like you could fly on the inside. Anybody experience that? That's the spirit is being built up. But if you don't do that, and instead, and I think the danger is busyness, also media, maybe you just sit all day looking at the computer, Facebook, social media, or even some of the garbage like pornography, and you try to look to other things besides the Lord to satisfy that place. And it could be money, it could be drugs and alcohol, but, but it's cisterns that there's no life there. You know, it's corrupted, it might have bugs, dirty, you know, or, or, or just dry. There's nothing there. The whole point is you won't be satisfied. You're always going to come away feeling empty. And that's what they're doing. They, they've left God. And the thing is, if you, listen, if you walk away from the Lord, I'll tell you something, the most empty person, a miserable person, is not the unsaved person in the world. It's the Christian who's tasted of the Lord, and then he goes back into the world. You got to sin twice as hard to get anything out of it. And I've seen people who knew the Lord who drifted away, and boy, oh boy, they are the most miserable. How many of you, you know, maybe in times where you've drifted, and you're miserable. Anybody experience that? It's like, because why? You've tasted the Lord. Nothing in the world compares. And um, verse 14, is Israel a servant? Is he a homeborn slave? Why is he spoiled? Meaning when you turn to the world, you end up being a slave. They end up being a slave to these nations that conquered them. Young lions roared upon him and yelled, and they made the land waste. The cities are burned without inhabitant. Also, the children of Naph, which in Tamphanes, which is Egypt, have broken the crown of their head, meaning where they looked to, these other nations and idols, now they became slaves to them. And if you looked anywhere in the world except God for the answers, you're going to end up being a slave. And then, have you, have you not procured this to yourself in that you have forsaken the Lord your God when he led you by the way? And now, what have you to do in the way of Egypt to drink the waters of Shior and, and and um, what have you to do in the way of Assyria to drink the waters of the river? Meaning you left God, the place of the promised land. Now you're in these other nations as a slave. And what he's saying is you've procured this to yourself, meaning you caused it. You know what's interesting, guys? God really doesn't have to judge or punish directly. All he's got to do is let sin take its course. You know, Galatians 6, 7, and 8, what does it say? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Why would it start off with being not deceived? Because the sin nature and evil says, oh yeah, God, God says don't commit adultery and sexual sin, but you can do it, it's fine, everybody's doing it, you'll get away with it. Or alcohol, or drugs, any kind of sin in the world, it tells you it's okay. It's not a big deal, everybody's doing it. But don't be deceived, God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, you plant this, you're going to reap. It isn't just an action. It's what you put in your heart and your mind. Hey, what you watch. And again, I think social media, I think the electronic screen is a huge distraction. And it's, there's such a pull in it to just be filled with the things of the world. And 99.9% .9 of it is garbage. I mean, listen to the word is fine. There's things you can watch that are edifying. What does it say in Philippians? Whatever is true, any virtue, any praise, think on these things. Be careful what you put in your mind. But if you put the garbage in, and then you start following those things. And again, I keep using an example of sexual sin. You know, the party scene, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So many people grow up thinking that's where life is. Go get drunk, do drugs, sleep around. And it's, I'm shocked at how many people choose that path. And they go down that path for years. And there's such an emptiness. And it eventually leads you to a, a self-destruction. You are there because you put yourself there. And I'm... Um, 
and the danger in again is it's a gradual slide and i think the problem too is there's a delay in the sowing and reaping you know if i plant a seed come back the next day there's nothing there it takes a while to eventually have a plant grow up you could start turning to god and start living for him and not see the blessings right away and some people turn to the Lord and their life is still hard. Well, I prayed, I sought the Lord, and my life still is rotten. How long did you do that? Two weeks. <laughs> how about two years? How about 20 years? The thing is, eventually, how many believe if you put God first and you sow to the Spirit, you're going to see blessing? It has to come up eventually. But see, also, flip it when it comes to sin. People turn to evil, they turn to sin, they don't see consequences right away. Maybe drugs here, pornography there, sexual sin there, alcohol. And little compromises, it's a gradual slide. And next thing you know, they're an alcoholic, they're a drug addict, they've lost their marriage, they've lost their family. You know, there's things that happen, that, but it takes time to get there. They don't see it right away. And they think it's okay. And they think that's the danger, it's a gradual slide. And in verse 20, he says, um, uh, where are we at here? Verse 19, he says, For thine own wickedness, shall correct thee. Wow, God just lets the, the, the consequences of your actions deal with them. Their backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see, it is an evil thing and bitter that you have forsaken the Lord your God, and that my fear is not in thee, says the Lord. So it's someone who knew God and walked away from him. That's a scary thing. For of old time, I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, and you said, I will not transgress. I set you free, and you're like, okay, Lord, I'll follow you. You know, how many people are in a difficult situation? Lord, please deliver me and I'll follow you. And he delivers them. But then it says you went upon every high hill. And under every green tree, you wandered to play the harlot. Green tree, the groves. See, the worship of Astareth was a sex goddess, fertility. That's where we get the word Easter from. And part of the worship was be out in nature, in the trees, the gardens. And so you say, and on one hand, you said, Lord, help me. But as soon as you had the chance, you went right back to the same old sin. And he said, yet I planted thee as a noble vine, holy a right seed. How then are you turned into the degenerate plant and of a strange vine unto me? Meaning they took God's blessings and instead of drawing near to him, they went away. You know, there's people that take grace as a license to sin. They started off well and they fell away. How did it happen? I think it's a gradual slide. I think it starts with losing the first love. Again, the very beginning things they talked about, now, is the Lord first in your heart? Do you want to be with him? Renew that. Do the first things. If you keep doing that, you'll never get to the point of sliding away. You know, I think that you know, fasting and prayer is a good thing to do. <laughs> you want to get an idea of how hard the flesh pulls on you? Try fasting a couple of days, and you'll find out how strong the flesh is. And um, I've done as many as 10 days, but let me tell you something. Every single time, it is so hard. But fasting is a great tool to draw near to the Lord. Verse 22, for though you wash thee with nitre and take thee much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord. Meaning, you can't get rid of it yourself. If you're in sin, the only way it can be dealt with is what? You come to the cross and you confess it and he'll forgive you. See what it is? There's like this stubborn independence where they don't need the Lord, they don't want the Lord. How can you say I'm not polluted? I'm not gone after a bow. See thy way in the valley. Know you... Know what you have done. You are swift, dromedary, traversing in your ways. What he's saying is they were in sin and saying, we didn't do anything wrong. We're not in sin. Denying it, ignoring it. Their conscience becoming callous. And he said, a wild ass used to the, used to the wilderness snuffs up the wind at her pleasure and her, her occasion. Who can, who can turn her away? All they that seek her will not weary themselves in her month shall they find her. So it's basically a female donkey in heat is out there for whatever male donkey that comes along. It's the idea that sin didn't have to chase them. They were going after the sin. They were just going for it. And that's what happens when you drift. You'll get to the point where you just you go for it. Withhold your foot from being unshod and thy throat from thirst. But you said, there is no hope, for I have loved strangers, and after them I will go. Now, here's an important point I want to throw out. You might be someone who's fallen. You might be someone who's failed. I've seen people fall into drugs and alcohol and sexual sin, and God got their attention. You can stop. You can turn back to the Lord and be forgiven. But here's what the devil does. He gets you to fall, 
And then he says, <laughs> you already fell. There's no hope. You might as well just go all out and sin. That's a lie. And that's what he was saying here. They had already fallen. And the devil comes along and says, you might as well just go into the world. There's no hope for you. That's a lie. At any point, when you realize you're going the wrong direction, you can stop and turn back to the Lord. The prodigal son was of the pigs. When he went back, it says the father ran to him. And I know people who have fallen, they've failed, and they've come back to the Lord. I don't care how bad you've fallen or failed, you can come back at any time. Don't have this attitude, well, I've already fallen, so I might as well just go further. As the thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They and their kings and their princes and their priests and their prophets. So what he's, he's, he's talking to Judah, Israel, the northern tribes have already been conquered. But he's saying just as a thief gets caught and he's ashamed, Israel was caught. Israel had failed. And now they're in a place of shame. We blew it. We ruined our nation. And here was part of their sin. They said to a stock, you are my father. And to a stone, you have brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, Arise and save us. What he's ashamed of is when they when you turn to an idol, when you put other things ahead of the Lord, like money, sex, alcohol, drugs, you know, and you turn to the world, you know what? It's not going to be there to help you. I remember somebody recently saw him post their life was a wreck. And it's somebody who knew the Lord, somebody at one time was walking with the Lord, but now they refer to the universe. And the universe decided to let this happen or did this. And, I'm like, and I, I sent them a message. I said, the universe is like a rock. Okay, the universe has no personality, no brain. The universe does nothing. But to account that it's the universe, some thing out there that I don't know what it is. The thing is, when you say universe, well, guess what? Universe can't tell me what to do. I'm not accountable to it. And you know what? And, and this person is like looking to the universe to help them. Nothing's going to happen because the universe can't do anything for you. And the thing is, is when you turn your thing, is you're, 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 you're calling a rock or a stick your father. <laughs> it can't do anything for you. And see, this was a lesson to Judah. In verse 28, he says, But where are thy gods that you have made, that may, that may, that, that you have made thee. Let them arise if they can save thee in the time of trouble for according to the number of thy cities are thy gods of Judah. Meaning Judah didn't learn from Israel. They're doing the same thing. And he's saying when Babylon comes, cry out to them. They're not going to help you. And see, guys, I've been a pastor for a long time, 30 years. And I'm starting to see patterns of people who have turned away, turned to the world. And they're empty. They're miserable. Broken lives, broken families. And, um, and, there's, and they, it just, it's shocking. It's shocking. If people could just see the end of the road. And he says, Wherefore will you plead with me? You have all transgressed against me. Why what he's what God's saying is, why do you pray to me when you don't do what I say? And then verse 30, in vain I have smitten your children, they receive no correction. And your own sword has devoured your prophets, like a destroying line, meaning that the sin of the parents, the kids followed. But here's the part that's scary. When God sent messengers, they killed them. And that's, that was true. If you don't like a message, you kill the messenger. And it's like, if, what he's saying is, why are you asking me to help when you won't do anything I tell you? How many believe 99.9% .9 of our problems are self-inflicted? We just need to listen to the Lord and listen to his word. And um, verse 31, oh, and I love this. Look at this. Oh, generations, like God's crying out to all of them. See ye the word of the Lord. What that means is look at God's word. That's what he's, how many of you believe someone needs to shout to our nation, look at God's word? Our nation's not listening to it. Have I been a wilderness to Israel, a land of darkness? Wherefore, say my people, we are lords, we'll come no more to you. Wow, there's the problem right there. Look what they're saying in verse 31. We're our own Lord. We're going to do what we want. Don't tell us what to do. How many of you say that's a common thing today? Nobody wants to be told what to do. Let me tell you something, guys. It's God's universe, and we got to be willing to listen to him. And, um, you know, what's interesting, heaven's going to be full of people who say to God, your will be done. Hell's going to be full of people where God says to the person, your will be done. You want to be your own Lord, do your own thing, then you're going to be separated. And he said, look at this. And so he's going to give some analogies that it's like, this is so ridiculous. Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride retire? Yet you have forgotten 
Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. Listen, has there ever been a bride that shows up at the wedding without her wedding dress and her ornaments? Have you ever seen a bride with her wedding dress? They treat that thing like a treasure. And he's saying, but you've, you've forgotten me. This is so ridiculous. Why trim thou your way to seek love? Therefore have you also taught the wicked ones thy ways. It, what it is, his idea is you're making yourself attractive. And see, evil tries to look attractive. People doing the wrong thing, even false prophets, false teachers, try to look appealing. But look what it's saying. They've taught wicked, meaning they're an influence of evil. That's the same thing. God's people now is influence of evil. And I think even there's Christians that are like that. Also in their skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. And I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these things. Meaning the evil and the sin, God didn't have to look hard to find it. In this case, the blood of the innocents killing their children. Because they worship Astrid, that you had sexual immorality as part of the worship. So it was unwanted babies. And so they would offer the children to Molech. They'd kill their own children. Guys, is our society worshiping sex? It is. Are there, is there unwanted babies? And it's a shocking thing. How um, there used to be a time for a wife, a woman to be a mommy and have children was this great blessing. Now children are treated like a disease to avoid. Do you guys realize that um, overpopulation has never been the danger? The big danger is depopulation. That's the danger. The birth rate in America and in China, in Europe and Russia, is below the replacement rate. What it means is there's not enough young people to take care of the old people. So there's an old people problem. Society is imploding all around us, around the world. And um, I'm doing my part to offset it with 14 children. But um, the thing is, is we don't see children as a blessing. And they, and they literally, the killing of the innocents, one thing God said he would. Now, Jesus' blood, if someone's had an abortion, he'll forgive that person. And if you've had an abortion, you're forgiven. And you should be the person talking louder than anybody against abortion. But, um, but as a nation, he won't forgive. And that's why I'm certain our nation is going to be judged. And um, yet you say, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead with thee, because you say I have not sinned. So here now, they're calling evil good and good evil. You know, abortion is being said to be a virtue now. It's actually freedom for women. And it's, have you heard people actually promote it as a virtue? This is a good thing. You should have an abortion. You know, gay marriage and the transgender stuff, it's all supposed to be this wonderful thing. Yet it's evil, and the thing is, they're, they're becoming hardened. And on verse 36, Why gaddest thou about so much to change thy way? You also should be ashamed of Egypt as you were ashamed of Assyria. Meaning, they're constantly wavering to the, to the tides of whatever, the latest fad. That's all they're doing. And the end result is, he says, You'll go forth from him and your hands upon your head meaning as a slave, for the Lord has rejected your confidences and you'll not prosper in them. They don't want the Lord, and he's saying, and they're going to be let off into slavery. And um, they were looking for to fit in in every way with society except what God said. And um, what's interesting, guys, the next chapter, you got to stamp all this God saying hard things to them. But look at chapter 3, verse 22 for a second. Here's the cry of God's heart that every chapter we need to read. Return ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. The offer is there. All you got to do is come back to me. Confess your sin. I'll help you. I'll forgive you. No matter how bad it is, don't continue. We're going to end with Revelation 3. And of course, this took way longer than I thought it would. There's a lot in this, and I don't want to skip anything. But Revelation 3. Jeremiah 2 is the same message as um, Revelation 3. And we talked about not leaving the first love. Well, this is heavy duty. Revelation 3, verse 14. He said, Now the angel of the church of Laodicea, and Laodicea means rights of the people. Um, right, the thing says, The amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. You're not hot. You're not cold or you're not hot. I want you cold or hot. So either be on fire for the Lord and live for him all out, or don't even say you're a Christian. But because you're lukewarm, lukewarm is you go through the motions and you say you're following God, but then you you don't really live it. He says, You're not, you know, you're not cold or hot. He says, I will spew you out of my mouth. Meaning it makes him sick for us to be in between. Either go all out for the Lord and don't say you're a Christian. Because you say I'm rich, increase with goods and have need of nothing. Notice 
that their measure of their standing was wealth. Remember I said prosperity doctrine is a lie? Wealth is not an indication of righteousness. They were looking at their financial blessings and saying, hey, we're right with God. Know ye not. And here's the issue of Laodicea. They didn't know their own condition. Don't you know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? How many of you, if you are wretched, miserable, blind, and naked, you'd want to know it? See, that's the problem with Laodicea and with Jeremiah's day is they were blind to their own condition. They thought they were right with God, and they weren't. And this is where we need to, we got to want to read these parts of the Bible. I counsel you, buy me gold, try in the fire, give up your wealth, and go through some trials that you may be rich. White raiment that may be clothed, that's Jesus' righteousness, that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. Annoy your eyes with eyesight, that's the Holy Spirit that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. God gives a hard message out of love. And instead of running from him, we need to run to him. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is Jesus talking to a church where he was on the outside. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Lord, I'm opening my heart to you. Come back in. I want to renew the first love. I want to start over. You know, give me a new start. I want to start reading my Bible and praying and seeking you. I want to do those first things over. To him that overcomes, why I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have overcame and sat down with my Father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says in the churches. What the Spirit is saying through Jeremiah to us is make sure your relationship with the Lord is real. You're not playing games. And you need to search your heart. And if there's anything from this message that's convicting you, just take the time to say, Lord, I think I'm drifting. You know, light the fire again. You know, create in me a clean heart. And you just start talking to him. And listen, when you leave here, you know, take it to heart and, and purpose and plan to do the first works over. As though you were just saved, do those things again and ask God to light that, that love again. I'm doing that. It's like I can go through the motions. I can serve him. And little by little, you can drift from the heart. I don't want to get to where I'm living like the world in rebellion and so blind. I want to be someone that's so close to him all the time that I hear his voice and that he's the first love. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. And I just pray that, um, Lord, you'd help us to take these things to heart. It's shocking to see the blindness of Israel doing things so evil and yet thinking they were okay with God. And, Lord, I see it all around me among Christians, and they have no discernment. They don't have a hunger for your word. And Lord, it's because they're not reading their Bibles. They're not spending time with you. So Lord, I ask above all that you would renew in us the first love. And Lord, for that to happen, we got to spend time with you. We got to listen to you. We got to make you a priority. Just like we need to do that in our marriages, we need to do that in our relationship with you. And Lord, I pray that everyone here would just draw near to you, that we'd run to you. Thank you. That even if we've fallen and failed, you'll forgive us and we confess our sins and cleanse us and we can have a new start right now today. And I pray we'd leave with that new start. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. May this be a week that God just draws you to himself, that you want to be closer to him than ever, and, um, and that you want to have that first love again. And if you do, just do the first things over. So um, God bless you. David left his first love, and he ended up committing adultery. And then he even murdered Bathsheba's husband to cover up, he thought, the sin, but God saw it. And he took his word through Nathan to expose that. And then he, sometime after that, Right away, actually, David confessed his sin, and uh, then he wrote the words in Psalm 51, which we're going to sing right now. It's a tremendous prayer. Um, may God help me and all of us to make it our prayer right now. And I know if it, uh, the Spirit of God is convicting me, and uh, probably most of us about something, we can cry out to Him. This is our prayer to God. just want to explain the chorus. It talks about, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. 
when we get to that, we have that was Old Testament. The Spirit came and went. He doesn't leave us now if we're truly born again, but we can still sing that. When I sing it, I always just, I understand that truth that he'll never leave me, uh, yet I can quench and grieve him. So don't take the blessing of the presence of the Holy Spirit from me. Don't take his fruit, love, joy, peace, etc. Just an important point. Lord, we just come before you. This is our prayer, Lord. Uh, we confess <clears throat> individually and definitely as body of Christ, how we've left your first, our first love on horrible. Help us to repent. Help us to just come back to the cross. Thank you that you died for these sins. Create voices as one voice, cast us not away, speaking about where we're at in the church, the body of Christ. Cast us not away from thy Oh, Lord, you're beautiful. 
face is all I seek. Your face is all I seek. For when your eyes are on this child, for when your eyes are on this child, your grace, your grace abounds to me. Tomorrow night, 7 p.m., time to pray right here. Praise the Lord.